we are getting connected four out of four connected love it i love it i love it um well yeah so while we're letting uh people uh get connected and come on and stuff i'll stall for a little bit uh, but just hello everyone um i'm sass as you know running for u.s house of representatives and today i brought on a friend of mine special guest annie callen uh who i know through the equal vote coalition um who's uh well i guess you tell you tell everybody uh you know who are you and uh what, what have you been doing how do we get connected sure um so i'm the chair of the equal vote coalition uh which advocates for star voting and um, other voting methods that satisfy the equal vote criterion. And so that's how I met SAS, um, because he's also a huge advocate for approval voting and star voting and other fair voting methods. Um, but that's my volunteer job um, for a day job. I work for a renewable energy company here in Portland, Oregon. And uh, yeah, that's about it, I think. Fantastic, yeah. And so uh, we, I, I don't know, Anybody who saw that I put out that uh, that tweet uh, a week or two ago, uh, just like, hey, anybody who wants to come on my stream, let me know, um, you know, what you want to talk about. And Annie reached out and said she wanted to talk about uh, the the entire U.S. Bill of Rights. Uh, and so I I have it pulled up here, and I'll probably throw um, you know just copy and paste some of the text in the chat as we go along to help people uh, stay along. But but yeah, I'd love to know like. What's your interest in this? Like, why the U.S. Bill of Rights? Why is this something you wanted to talk about? Yeah, yeah. And I realized before coming onto this call that it's actually a huge subject. We probably could, you know, talk for an hour on just any one of the amendments. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the thing that interests me about it is that it's almost like if you look at the Constitution, it's a very, in some ways, very dry document. It's like a instruction book for the government um really important of course but um the bill of rights is almost more like a philosophical uh document it's like something more to do with you know what do we stand for what are our values and what's important to us um so i think that's what's fascinating to me about it and and probably why it wasn't actually included in the constitution itself is because in some ways, it's almost unnecessary for a document that's talking about, well, how is our government structured and yet has become so important to what it means to be an American? Yeah, it definitely. Um, sorry, I'm a very echoey space. Sometimes I yell over myself. Oh, no, that's uh, fine. It, uh, it, it does feel like separate and it's own. it does feel like like it's this this extra like it is a, has a different nature to it. I mean, particularly because there are 10. I know originally there were 12 was the plan, um, and 10 of them made it, made it through the process. But um, it, it certainly, I think, I think you've, you've put it into words in that, like, it's this dichotomy of, like, this just kind of, like, mechanics versus, like, philosophy yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that that's a, a really good way to put it and to better understand the context of, like, all right, the mechanics won over these type of people but there was a whole other group of people they had to work with that were like they needed a philosophical justification um and so that was really important and so uh, yeah i think it was really great so is there uh is there any particular place do you want to just start with the preamble do you want to go straight to the first amendment or or do you have ones you want to highlight or yeah i mean we could probably start with the first amendment which you know by itself has so many rights in it and it's funny how short these are for how yeah. important they are and and how much they cover um, but before we jump into that i just want to clarify one thing that i learned just yesterday which is that actually of the 12 that were proposed 11 have actually gone through mm -hmm. but the 11th one didn't go through until like 1992 when it was ratified um which i thought was pretty fascinating yeah our 27th amendment and if yeah. you consider that that was written back in the 1780s that yeah. means there's no language in our constitution that was written in the last half century. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I have a whole bit about, I don't know if it's a living document anymore. Maybe it could be revived, whatever, but we can definitely uh, focus on, you know, I definitely want to, I mean, like you said, just the first amendment alone has so many rights in it. And it was so interesting, you know, um, when I, when I started campaigning and I started, I'm, I'm I'm looking through this entire document more, much more often than I used to. Yeah. Um, and so 
it's uh, like one of the things for me is like the way that human rights are spelled out in this document is like mechanically different from the way that we think about human rights today. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just like an important thing to understand and highlight, but I'm sure you could, you could talk about that. So I, want, I just want to let you say what you want to say about it. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so, so you mean jump into the, the first amendment here? Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, um, it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition petition the government for redress of grievances. Um, so, you know, obviously these are all really vital and important rights that we have as citizens. And, you know, I think it's interesting that it is talking about what rights the people have, whereas most of the constitution is talking about what rights the states have or what right the um you know the executive branch or congress or the supreme court have but this is talking about the people themselves what are the rights that they have um so the first one freedom of religion it's i think pretty surprising that in those days that they even considered this because i mean there wasn't a lot of variation in religion like i think pretty much everybody was christian right so you know there were a few jewish people there was you know protestants and catholics but um the fact that they were they had the foresight to understand that that's important that people can have you know any religious beliefs and and that the government shouldn't be involved with that that alone is is pretty revolutionary um and well, I'll, just, I'll just say while you're thinking, um, you yeah. know, I, you know, it's it's easy to criticize the Constitution. There, there are lots of things that I would criticize in it, particularly from a, um, you know, like with the modern voting science that we have and the way right. that they set up a lot of that stuff uh, with a lot of complaints. But there are some things in it that are really, really were revolutionary. I mean, the three branch system, the di- the division of levels of government through the republic, and like you said, this this freedom of religion. Um, the, you know, some of these things were, were really, you know, big deal. Um, and, and I think meant a lot and, and meant, and, and we, if we look at other countries around the world, even those with much more modern constitutions, many of them are modeled after ours in a variety of different ways. So right. um, you're, you're very right that that freedom of religion thing, that was, uh, that was a big deal. And, and I think what's interesting to me is that the document, when you look at, if you look at the Bill of Rights as a document, it has like really important values in it but you know a lot of those values were not being carried out day to day at the time certainly um you know and sometimes to this day aren't so obviously people discriminated against each other in yeah. basis of religion and all these other things but the fact that what it says in writing is that the government can't decide those things that's you know i think an important first step and and so sometimes the humans are flawed and we're going to make mistakes, but we can set up our systems in such a way that um, they, they are better than we are in some ways. And so that hopefully over time, those systems can, um, you know, make a really robust government and, and something that will last for a long time and eventually hopefully become the thing that it needs to be. Um, so did you want to keep talking about religion or we should move on to the next one? Did you yeah, let's, let's keep moving. Okay. Uh, abridging the freedom of speech is the next one. That one I think is really interesting nowadays because people talk a lot about social media and do you have freedom of speech on social media or are they a private business that can, you know, knock you off of their platform? Um, I think it's really complicated. Um, you know, when you're talking about you know, social media being one of the main ways that people communicate these days, should that be considered, you know, an inherent value that people have or shouldn't it? Um, You know, it's not the government stopping people from speaking, but, um, you know, you can see, again, this this is sort of a value that Americans hold 
And so we tend to, even when we're not talking about the government, we tend to have these values of like, no, you should let me speak freely on your platform. Even if it's not enforceable by the government, we just hold that as a value of like, this is important, it should be allowed. Um, so the next one being freedom of the press. I think that's actually very similar to freedom of speech. It's just being extended to an organization. And again, that's one that becomes complicated by our modern world, because what, what does the press mean? Is social media press? Um, or do you have to have a, a paper that's printed on paper? I mean, a lot of uh, media doesn't even do, do that anymore. So how do you even define what press means? Um, so that one, you know, is interesting. The right of the people to peaceably assemble. <laughs> That one I don't think has changed much over the years of what that means, but I think it is it is something that is hugely important. Um, and it's difficult, you know, you, you don't always see that being maintained. And I don't know how, I, I think the, the best way to maintain that is for people to continue to do it, to continue to go out and peacefully protest, um, just, to assert that yes, we are the people and we have a right to do this. And, you know, if, if, uh, you know, anybody tries to stop us, there's more of us, the people, than there are of the institutions that would try to stop that. Um, and then to petition the government for redress of grievances, I'm actually not sure what that means exactly. Do you, are you familiar with that one? Yeah. And, you know, well, let's come back around to that yeah. in a minute because I want to go yeah. over some of the other things. So, yeah. Um, you 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 definitely highlighted this thing of like, and this is what I was talking about earlier about the way we think about the mechanics of rights has changed, and like this mm -hmm. is about the the government cannot take it away from you. Right. But today, when we think about rights, we think of it as the government guaranteeing it for you, mm -hmm. and those are two right. fundamentally different things. And as mm -hmm. you were highlighting about this social media issue, is like there is this fundamental like disconnect there that we like. How do we bridge this gap? Um, and I've talked about this before, so I won't, I'm not going to go into huge detail with it. I've done, I did a live stream on it a few weeks ago. Um, but like, yes, recognizing that, you know, legally, Facebook, Twitter, they can ban whoever they want. Right. But it is important to our values and who we are as people. It is how we speak today. Right. And I've thought, I, I think that, that a, a, um, a, a path toward addressing this issue that people care a lot about, I think for good reason, Mm -hmm. is um, when it needs to be global, I think the United Nations needs to recognize large social media platforms as digital countries with digital mm -hmm. citizens. And mm -hmm. then what they can do is just like they already have a, a list of human rights for physical countries, mm -hmm. they can have a list of digital rights for digital citizens in digital countries. Interesting. Um, and whether or not free speech is necessarily one of them, I think is debatable. I mean, that's a very American right. culture thing. I don't want to push that on the world right. uh, necessarily. But, um, you know, the, that, that they have to be very clear and forward about like what the rules are around what you can say on their platform or, um, yeah, yeah. you know, or, or, or data and privacy rights. So I, I think that's a, a, a better way to move forward with that particular topic. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it is important to recognize like the specific legal language. Um, Freedom of the press, you also brought up a good thing. This is something else I talk about too, is I want to cleanly define what counts as press. Because like right. you said, it's, it's ill-defined right now. Right. Um, and, and it's actually, this is one of the things where I'm like, we actually used to do this better. Um, we used to have in the newspaper an opinion section and a hard news section. Right, and those right. two, Yeah, those two have become one and the same. And yeah. so I, I don't necessarily think, believe that I'm gonna be the person to write the best language for it. I, I think that there are others who I would lean on for that. But if we can separate and categorize these different forms of media, uh, then we can go to opinion, we can reapply fairness doctrine, which we have historical precedents for, and then we can just work to decouple press from the profit motive. I have a couple ideas around that. One I like is journalism vouchers, where we give every American money that they can only spend on, on uh, subscription journalism uh, to help decouple it. But so I have like a whole thing about that, uh, but I'm totally with you. Like, Press is ill-defined right now, and I think that if we cleanly define it, again, this I'm not the only person who should be part of that conversation. Right. Uh, that could be really helpful. Um, peaceably to assemble, I have nothing to add. You're totally right. Just keep doing it. And then to petition the government, yeah, I, 
So that that is like saying you have the right to like go talk to your representatives mm -hmm. and to like yeah. try to get them to do what you want. Right. But what that has turned into is lobbying in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so um, it's. <sighs> It's like I do believe that the people th there there is something I, I I want I am building a platform for a continuous public feedback loop to get people more involved and directly connected and, and quantify how people feel about the actions and decisions and votes of their representatives and to put it into like scorecards that make it really easy and turn into like a social media aspect so it's actually engaging leverage proxy voting get more people involved and i think that would be a really cool way for the people to start to take back petitioning for themselves mm -hmm. um you know i don't like lobbying uh because it is just so often goes toward the trend of like corporation paying lobbyists who you know leverage human psychology is effectively what they're doing uh to get representatives to just keep the status quo and not actually change anything for the better um, and, and we've seen the negative effects of that. I think something that would be really powerful is if, you know, House and Senate rules were adjusted that allowed representatives to work from home rather than having to be in D.C. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and allowed them to be more connected with their constituents and, and bring more things, you know, more stuff on the floor. And um, I, I think that that would I think that could be really helpful. Of course, then you got to get the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader to agree with it, which is the exact opposite of what they want. But yeah. that's at least where my mind is sitting on, on, on that particular issue. Yeah, you said a lot of really interesting things there. Um, this idea of journalism vouchers is, is a pretty great idea. I like that because, you know, there's some newspapers I'd like to subscribe to, but they cost like $100 a year or something. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, I don't know if I need it that much, but uh, mm -hmm. but if I had a voucher that could, you know, offset the cost of that, then that would, you know, maybe be an incentive. Um, what was some of the other stuff you said? Oh, lobbying. Yeah, that's that's another way that money gets into our politics. It's a big way that money gets into our politics. Mm -hmm. So that's that's tricky. And I think part of the problem with lobbying is that your average citizen doesn't have a chance to, they don't have the time to dig in to see what their senators are doing, what their representatives are doing. They're, you know, they've got their day jobs and, and they're busy, they got their kids, you know. And so the people who are paying attention to what's going on, a lot of times are, are the, you know, the lobbyists who are, who are paying to get the things done that they want to get done. So I don't know what the solution there is, but um, yeah, clearly there's a problem there. Um, yeah. Move on to the second amendment. So we yeah, can let's move on. Now this one. <laughs> it, it, I just have a problem with the grammar. It's just very poorly structured. It's, it's, the sentence is very poorly structured, but go for it. Yeah, it's this is a tricky one. So I'll read it. Uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Yeah, is there a verb missing there? <laughs> a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. It's just the commas. Yeah. Like, it could be, re the clauses could be rearranged. Like, yeah, it, you're right. That's a bad, badly written sentence just from a grammar standpoint. And it's, I think it's a very confusing... <sighs> It, it's. I, I think the reason why it's confusing to us in the modern age is because when it was written, it was very easy to know what an arm was and what a militia looked like. And, um, you know, to, to our eyes in the modern day, we look at that and it's like, well, what is it? What is an arm? You know, it's not a, a or a rifle where you're packing the powder in anymore. Right. What does a grenade count? Right. Does a right, tank right. count? Like I mean, what? Where's yeah. Nuclear missile. Like what? What does that mean exactly? And so, yeah, I I understand the point of it, and I think the point still stands today, which is that the people should have a right to defend themselves against a corrupt government, and we should you know make sure that we. Um, we maintain that and that we, we ensure it, but, but I think, you know, not only is there a question of, does this apply to nuclear missiles, but there's also the question of, 
well, what are the weapons of the modern age? And I think increasingly it's digital. I think increasingly mm -hmm. we're going to find that um, things like hacking and um, misinformation and, you know, other, other kinds of technology based uh, I, I don't even know if weapon is the word, but but aggression is going to increasingly be what we have to look out for, you know, in terms of international conflict, but also, you know, domestically. And so this one, this one's a hard one because I'm not sure how much it applies anymore to, to the day and age, but I, I think that the sentiment is important, which is that you know, if our government becomes corrupt and the only way to take it back is by force, that we should have the means to do that, whatever that means. It's interesting. I was going to go into a whole bit. I've got a whole thing about guns by mm -hmm. leveraging local well-regulated militias to mm -hmm. write the rules and regulations mm -hmm. for their own jurisdictions. Um, and uh, but, but when you went into the digital thing, that made me think of whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. Like... like I almost see, I mean, like we say freedom of the press and that's, you know, and like that's where I would normally categorize whistleblowers under, but you have a really good point about like digital arms, like actually like whistleblowing is a type of digital arm mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I, like that is fascinating to me now. I haven't thought about it in that context before. That's really interesting. Right. That, like, there we can use digital arms to fight back against the government which actually just reinforces the need for free and open internet right um, right which is also really powerful so that's uh wow that's that's really intriguing i, I really I'm, that's a really uh, interesting route you went down with that <laughs> i'm always thinking about you know what's the technology going to be like in 20 years or 40 years or 100 years and the truth is there's no way i can know because things are going to change so much in ways that there's no way that I can predict it. But that's kind of what we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about what kind of rules are, are we going to set up and how are we going to set them up? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you know, there's definitely uh, deeper conversations that need to happen around that, which is why we need people in Congress who uh, live in the information age and not in the yeah. 20th century. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's and it's tricky because you know a lot of times older people are the people with experience in government. So you know, it kind of makes sense that they're the ones that sort of get elected. But um, but just because you're older doesn't mean you can't be educated on technology and and uh, have an interest in thinking about the future. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not opposed to I'm not it's not about being ages necessarily it's more just about the people who who aren't who don't understand this stuff who aren't yeah. living in today's age i don't care how old they are right, like right. yes they will tend to be older but that's that's not actually the qualification the qualification is do do you know how to send an email right, right. like <laughs> right like that like you can't be asking when, when you're when mark zuckerberg is testifying in front of you you need to be like asking him questions about antitrust not yeah, yeah. about why your campaign emails are going to spam yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg is not your personal help desk. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you want to keep moving on to the next one? Sure. Yeah, I don't think we, we uh, solved any debates <laughs> just yeah. now, but, uh, but I don't think that's possible. So, um, Third Amendment. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in manner to be prescribed by law. So that's basically just saying you can't use people's homes to house soldiers, even in war. I'm not sure what the manner to be prescribed by law part means. So I guess, is that saying that the government can just decide by law to, to use your house? for? I think, yeah, I think in theory, you could, the like Congress yeah. could pass a law and, and the president could sign it and it would do it. But like, that's a whole process. Um, right. Whereas the military might just on its own volition go up and knock on somebody's door. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I don't know for sure, I, this definitely needs a fact check, but I believe that, that there was like an incidence of that uh, last year in, uh, in, I think it was Washington, D.C., where, mm -hmm. where it was like 
the mm. National Guard was like trying to stay at people's homes and people mm. were like, no, you're not, you can't, it's my third amendment right <laughs> you stay out. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny because it's, I, I, you know, what you're saying vaguely sounds familiar, I'd have to fact check it as well, but um, certainly it has not ha happened very often, if at all, that this- In recent history. Up. In recent yeah. history, yeah, it's something that I think was a big deal at the time, and yeah. it's you know it kind of makes me think of a, a medieval world. This idea that you know, as troops are marching across the landscape, they you know are going to eat the food of the farms they come across and sleep, you know, house their officers in the in the buildings and things like that. But I don't think it's a big deal today. But it's still an important amendment to have just in case and. And again, it's it's laying out like all of these. The thing that runs through all of them is that the individual humans that are the citizens of this country have rights that are are bigger and more important than the government or you know the institutions that make up the government. Yeah, that is, that is a really good point. It's like even some of these ones that are kind of like there are some that are aren't nearly aren't that applicable these days anymore. Um, but like the phil it's a it's about the philosophical package of the Bill of Rights and it adds right. to that and it reinforces it um, that it's 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 not just the text on the page it's it's like a, a deeper interconnected meaning of it right exactly yeah. so all right let's, let's go for the fourth amendment um, the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Um, so this one certainly still has relevance today. Um, you know, I think a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of their rights if, you know, a police officer comes to the door. I'm not an expert in that myself, but, um, but I think sometimes the state will use people's ignorance against them. If you know people aren't aware of their rights, they'll find ways to, um, you know, manipulate people into into um, giving up those rights. And so, um, you know, the the fact that they can't come into our house without a warrant is important. And and I think that the exception there is if a, if a police officer thinks there's immediate danger going on inside the house then they have a right to go in to to try to resolve the situation which you know i can respect if i'm being attacked in my home i do want the police officer to come in but that fact can be manipulated and and can be um you know they can make up any kind of excuse oh i thought i heard screaming inside you know whether they did or not it's a hard thing to prove and so this can result i think in a lot of unnecessary um, violence and and, um, and and just a violation of people's rights to be able to, to be safe in their homes. Yeah, we definitely see a lot of civil cases leaning on the Fourth Amendment, um, for sure, uh, and uh, civil and criminal cases, I should say. Um, and uh, I do know that the police have some kind of like acronym that, like, goes over all the things that, that they're allowed to like enter a place without a warrant because of, um, and it's mostly seemed pretty sensible to me, but again, it's, it's about like, what, how does it settle in court? What does it come down to? Right. Um, you know, and uh, the, 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 the whole idea of like, this also digs into um, the, the checks and balances of the three branch system of like, okay, well now you have the judicial branch checking on the executive branch through this warrant process. So like mm -hmm. you need to get a warrant from a judge and you can only search and seize what is spelled out in the warrant specifically. Like, right, that and that's, really... that's laid out right here in the amendment, so yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but I also want to extend this too into like, what about our smartphones? What about all the data mm -hmm. on there? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, and saying they can't go through our papers, like in my head, that includes every text message I've ever sent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, yes, it's going through some third party thing, but like anything that I have stored on my phone and if it's yeah. only on my phone, yeah, you hands off. Um, and, and, and to be totally honest, like 
I'm the kind of person that's like, even if you got a warrant, I'm still not unlocking my phone for you. I would, I would destroy my phone first and have to go get a new one and pull like the encrypted backup from like my own computer or whatever, or like the cloud or whatever it is before you get to see any of that. Um, yeah, but the thing is, they don't need you to hand it over because they can just, um, you know, I think it's the Patriot Act that that gives the government the ability to, you know, talk to the, the information, I don't know what you call them, the, the service that provides, you know, your phone data and, and just, um, just say, hey, give me that data. And, you know, here's here's the uh, court order. And, you know, they don't, I think, I think the Patriot Act in some ways is stepping around this Fourth Amendment in that regard um, and, and allowing the government to come in and just take anybody's data. You know, of course, that's what, um, uh, I'm spacing on his name, the, the guy that leaked. Um, the fucking, what's that? Edward Snowden with the NSA? Yes, Snowden, yeah. You know, I think that's what he revealed was that they weren't just going in and being like, oh, this drug lord or this terrorist. They were just en masse taking everybody's data. And um, I don't know that that's ever actually been resolved. I mean, it's like, okay, well, we know about it now, but it's still happening. It's like... And, yeah, it's like so many other things, right? Like, we know it's happening, but there's just so much, um, which yeah. I think is why you and I are so interested in voting method reform specifically, because we know that that's kind of one of the big first steps to actually yeah. addressing these things. And I think part of the problem, and, and we're kind of experiencing this ourselves, is there's so much that's so important that can be overwhelming. Like, it, one single individual in their daily lives in between all of their normal responsibilities how can you keep up with, you know, what the government might be stealing from you or what, you know, um, you know, what new technology is doing to our brains or, you know, what the press might be doing or, you know, there's just so much that it's hard to keep track of it, which is why I think we need to have such robust systems in place protecting us and, you know, we can all take our piece of the puzzle. So, you know, the piece that I'm taking is voting method reform, but if somebody else is taking the piece of, um, you know, information uh, security, and you know, somebody else is looking at the press, and then if we can all do our part to help with the, the one thing that we can become an expert in, then working together, we can protect ourselves. Yeah, definitely. Uh, should we push forward? Yep, let's keep going. We're we're halfway through. We're on, yep, Amendment 5 now. Uh, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. There's a lot there. That's almost like the First Amendment in terms of how much that's covering. Um, so let's skip to, so double jeopardy. So you can't be tried twice for the same crime. Um, I think we can all agree that makes sense. Um, well, let's, let's go over, let's go over why real quick, because I think, sure. I think, um, for some people that is going to be obvious, but some people it, it's, it's less obvious. So why, why do you think, um, that not being able to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb is. Yeah, so I think, I think what you could do with that, if that wasn't in place, you could punish your political opponents or just somebody you don't like, or like, for example, um, you know, if I was in a position of power and I arrested somebody or had them arrested and and they go through the trial and they're declared innocent. And then a few weeks later, I'm like, you know what? I don't like that they went free. <laughs> I don't like that they got an innocent charge. So I'm going to arrest them again and charge them again. Uh, maybe this time I, you know, 
I can get them indicted. Um, you could do that any number of times and you could just put somebody through hell and they could get declared innocent every time. Or maybe, you know, me as being the evil position and person in position of power would get my way and eventually a judge would, you know, side with me. And so it's just, there's too much. It, it's not respecting the, the court process to say, no, this person was declared innocent. And yeah, the courts can be wrong. That happens all the time. But we have to try to set up our court system to be as, as good as possible so that once you're declared free, that's it. You know, if you commit another crime after that, then it's fair game. But for the same crime, you know, it's interesting because when I think about it, I think about like when new evidence is found, like found, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. actually like, it, I, I was thinking it's to protect from the case of somebody planting evidence when they thought somebody they were trying to get who was actually innocent right. was like, okay, well, obviously that wasn't enough to convict. So let's try again with this new evidence I just quote unquote found. Right. right. Um, and so, uh, but, I, but I really like the way that you put it is like, the justice system needs to exist as is, and there needs to be a certain amount of sanctity in it, of like, um, particularly when we get to the part about uh, uh, a jury of peers, um, you know, and, and uh, how, and, and like the way, the way that we configure it, like we, it, it also helps to, yeah, I think actually, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it is it helps it, it helps to keep the sanctity of the judicial system and to say, hey, this branch is real and it, and it actually does things and it means things and it has power and, it, and it, the interpretations it makes are, are significant. Um, so that, yeah, I think that, that was, that's a, a really, um, I, li I like the way that you put that. It was a little bit different from the way I interpreted it. Yeah, and you know, to my mind, if, if anything, we need to be more concerned about the justice system you know, over prosecuting people or wrongfully um, finding people guilty. I think that probably happens a lot more than the reverse. It kind of falls in the line of innocent until proven guilty. It's like it's better to risk a guilty person walking free than to risk an innocent person being put in jail. So, like, if we're going to err, we should err on the side of innocent until proven guilty. And I think that also speaks to how just or unjust our laws are. I, th I think we do have a lot of unjust laws right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I would agree that I think right now that is the direction that we should be trying to err toward. Um, but, you know, it's, it's maybe that'll change in the future, but, but re regardless is like, yeah, I, 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 think, I, think, I think you've highlighted it in a good way. Um, and so then, uh, yeah, so there was, yeah, there was, that's right, there was a bunch of stuff about the military and the militia. Yeah, I just um, kind of skipped over that because I, I don't, I don't know a lot about that, but um, you should not be held to answer for infamous crime unless on, unless a grand jury, so yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but. Well, uh, the first bit, I think. I was just gonna say it's interesting that um, that there's this exception for the military, which I think is, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I th I think I understand why it's there, which is that you know in in the military situation maybe you don't have time for a grand jury, but I think that creates problems. Um, I, I I feel like we shouldn't have an exception for for people getting fair trial yeah military court is is definitely a little bit different from civilian court um and i think that there are negative knock-on effects from that yeah um, and so i mean we would need a constitutional amendment to fix that right um uh, but uh so all right uh same offense um nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself um yeah, that's interesting. And, and I don't know what that's speaking to exactly historically, um, but it might be to prevent a situation where a person is threatened. You know, you have to, you know, you have to admit to this crime or we're going <laughs> to hurt your family or something like that. I, that's the only thing I can think of that would 
that would cause that to be there. Is it, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I have wondered it. I've never Googled it. Uh, let me witness again. I, I don't think it says here, but I, I know you also can't um, testify against your spouse either. So I imagine it's a similar reasoning. Oh, this is plead the fifth. This is uh, like, yeah, yes. Right, 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 of course. Right. You don't have to answer questions or otherwise give testimony against himself or herself, which will subject her, him or her to an incrimination. Yeah, that's what it's talking about. It's saying right, you, you, right, don't, right. you don't, you are not, you don't have to answer questions. Right, um, right. And then nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now this one, I have some strong feelings about. But I want to hear your take first. Well, um, I, I assume you're thinking of the same thing I'm thinking of, uh, which is, um, I can't think of the, the term for it now, but the government frequently will go in and just take people's homes for public use or... Um, That's the, the next bit. Property. Oh, no. Yeah, it says property in there. Yeah, no, you're right. Life, liberty, property, uh, due process of law. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and say what you're thinking about it? Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was thinking of something else. Um, no, uh, no, uh, yeah, so so um, nor shall be deprived of life. This is this is huge for me. Fighting for universal basic income. I yeah. see that it's a way to guarantee people's right to life. Oh, um, and again, it is this nor shall be deprived of it, rather than you guaranteeing know like guaranteeing it. Yeah. it. Um, but but you know it's. It's a, it's, the wording is a little bit different from what we saw in the First Amendment. And you know, just, you know, to say that somebody's being deprived of life, like, I think, um, I, I, in a way, I do see it as like, well, by withholding, you know, funds or, or like, like, there was just a, a, um, something that happened in some county in Texas that was like they decided not to extend their free lunch program or something for like school lunch program mm -hmm. and i was like so you're depriving these kids of food you're which is in a way depriving them of life right, um, right, right. you know in, in a way uh you know holding it but if a kid can't pay for lunch like you don't like in my head that is the government depriving of life and and this doesn't there's no distinction in here between adults and children in the in, in this in this amendment right um and so and so I, I think about like what is the what is what is the extent by which we can actually interpret this phrase nor be deprived of, of life um how far can we go with that and how much can we use it to 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 justify what what the government does and doesn't do for and against the people um, yeah and I think, you know, the intention of this is that you can't be killed, you can't be put in jail, and you can't have your stuff taken away from you unless you've gone through the court system and be de mm -hmm. declared guilty and, you know, your sentence given. Um, so that's, you know, I think what you're describing isn't necessarily the intention of this part of this amendment, but it doesn't necessarily mean we couldn't decide that that's the value that we're going to have. And that's another good point, too, is like, what is the intention, right? Because now, I mean, if we look at the Second Amendment, intention is is what people talk about all the time around it. It's like, what is the intention? Well, the intention was around these muskets, not around right. what we have today. But also, like, can we find a, can we find a way? Can we create a way? to make this amendment work in the context of the 21st century. Right, and, right. and and so I think I think that's kind of along the similar line of thinking. And I mean, like, there's a certain degree of like, yeah, I, maybe I am trying to manipulate it too much. Like, you might be right. I think that's like, I think that's a fair criticism. Um, and and so, but, but I mean, thinking about like, other things about like, okay, what about when the police shoot people? Yeah. You yeah, know, that's, like, that's... that's big that's a big problem here yeah it's, it's straight up depriving people of life like there's no right. there's no two ways about that right right um so yeah it's uh it th there's there's a lot to be unpacked in that especially because there are other times in uh additional amendments down the road i think in like the 15th 
we see with the same phrase, life, liberty, or property, um, as it gets extended to more people throughout the country, um, or guaranteed to more people, more uh, or more demographics throughout the country, I should say. Um, but yeah, there's there's so many, there's so much to unpack there. But but yeah, there, there's definitely that that phrase is uh, I think about that a lot. Yeah, and it's really relevant. Like as you pointed out, um, you know, if a police officer is defending themselves, then you know, fair enough. But you know, oftentimes I think they you know, that's not the case. And so, yeah, we do need to make sure that we're enforcing this. And, um, and because if, if you've been killed, you you don't have the opportunity for that due process of law. It's Mm -hmm. been stolen from you. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's very relevant still today. Absolutely. Because we should Uh, keep moving along. It's already 50 minutes in. Oh no, we're only halfway through. <laughs> I mean, I think we've gone through most of the juicy ones. They get yeah. a little bit more esoteric as we go along. But mm-hmm. um, I think this last piece, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So they do allow for private property to be taken if a person is paid. But the problem is that the government also gets to decide what's fair. I think that's determined to be market value, whatever that means. So it's, it's, I don't like that (laughs) the government could just decide that my home is going to be a freeway and um, they could pay me what they think my house is worth and not taking into account any emotional value that I have for it or anything else. Um, I, you know, it says here that they can do that, but um, I disagree with that as a value. Well, and and I'll, I'll go along with what I'll add on to what you're saying. Like, that I think still is open for interpretation and could change in the future. Like I could see a Supreme Court case redefining what just compensation means. Right, right, um, right. You know, I mean, like, and then, you know, when we take a look at like um, land stolen from uh, indigenous peoples, right. you know, it's like, all right. What's the just compensation for that? Yeah, them? what is it? That's certainly whatever it was. I guarantee it wasn't just. <laughs> You know, um, so there's certainly a degree there of like, you know, there's there's certainly there's certainly many times that uh, these men that these rights have not been have not been followed. These amendments have not been followed. Um, And so just trying to continue, uh, you know, it's why we lean on them so much that why they're cited just so often. Right. And again, Um, you know, for the most part, the values in them are solid and are good, even if the people that wrote them had problems and didn't necessarily follow these things. And even if our government hasn't always been consistent in following it, we can still look at the values and say, you know, these are good values for the most part. Do you want to uh, try to get to the rest of it or do you want to like try to try to do a part two another time? Um, it's up to you. Uh, we could do a speed run. Like I, like I said, I think they get a little bit more esoteric as we, as we go along. So, you know, I don't know if they're, Okay, yeah. I, then I think yeah. Let's let's go. Let's get through. Let's uh. We'll keep going. I just had somebody in the chat uh, who I know uh, thinking about part two later. And Jolly, um, just talking to him in the chat. You'll always be able to come back and watch him. I, this all gets uploaded to my YouTube channel automatically. Um, I'll send you a link um, as if you if you want to watch the rest of it at a later time. But appreciate that. Cool. So Amendment Six, go for it. All right. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district where the crime shall have been crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witness against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. So again, this is more legal protections. You can have an attorney, you know, um, the jury in your district, you know, um, all of these things that are important to our legal rights. I'm really into the, um, you know, it's so in- interesting because it says impartial jury, um, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm super mm-hmm. into the idea of a jury of your peers, randomly selected. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this is something we, we talk a lot about now in democratic reform space, sortition and citizens assemblies of large groups of of randomly selected citizens to give ideas about about legislation, but this is a smaller version of it. 
But right. when you add in the word impartial, uh, that means that there is a process that people get selected to juries. And there are some pieces, some, some parts of that process, I think are sensible um, in terms of like, um, you know, picking people who um, maybe have like moral, some kind of a moral stance that would prevent them from, from going along with a certain kind of prosecution, even if it fit the crime. Um, for example, capital punishment. I would never ever serve up capital punishment, and that may actually get me disqualified from a jury on, on cer or a jury on certain cases. Right, um, right. And you know, as much as as much as I disagree with that, I think that that is like reasonable given the law. Um, but right. but it also translates as well into like we've seen so much like racism inherent in the jury selection process, and um, and and other like how do we define what is impartial? Um, you know, and so that is that is ever evolving. Uh, but I guess I mean that's you know that's that's what the that's what the judicial branch is about. It's about these are the laws and how do they interpret it? Right. And I think one of the the biggest problems we have currently is this speedy and public trial. Um, mm -hmm. I remember reading about a guy who was you know awaiting trial and he was in prison for I can't remember how long. But it was a long time, like a year or something, just awaiting trial and ha hadn't even been convicted. And um, I think he ended up committing suicide later. And it's like, wait a minute, that's, that is not how we're supposed to be doing this. So yeah, we need to make sure to, to uphold that. Yeah, making sure, making sure that they're speedy. And, and you know, there's, there's um, you know, it's like that relies on being able to have enough people working in that space, you know, having enough judges and having the, the clerks and everything who to help to help move that along. Um, and so there's uh, particularly because so much of that is poured onto states and counties uh, of that work right. um, that maybe there's a certain degree of like, OK, well, in the federal government, if this is going to be guaranteed by the, the Constitution that affects the whole country, then mm. perhaps the federal government needs to have a role in ensuring that those processes can go can can be can be speedy. Um, so if that's funding or, or other forms of support and resources, um, you know, even if we allow the real control to be down at the county level or in the state level, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we definitely we definitely need to to configure that more or, or think about that more uh, and confront it more. Um, but again, also having fewer unjust laws, I think, would also be helpful. <laughs> So we're not arresting people so often for something. Yeah, that would, that would help a heck of a lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Seventh Amendment. In suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. So I think, is that talking about lawsuits? Yeah, and and, and so so this is this is really interesting because I feel like Right, then, according to the rules of the common law. So I think it's saying that if you've been tried in front of a jury, in, it says re-examined in any court of the United States, but people um, appeal. I feel, I feel like I see uh, all uh, trials all the time that have been appealed even though they've gone in front of a jury. And so I'm, I'm having trouble like connecting this in my brain of like, what's going on with this. Yeah. Well, it, you know, appeal is different because you're taking it to a higher court. But is that not count as re-examining in an, any court of the United States? Yeah, that's a good question. I, this is another one we'll probably have to <laughs> Google later and come back mm -hmm. to. All right, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, no cruel, unusual punishments inflicted. Um. You know, another hugely important one, and you know, you talked about capital punishment. A lot of people will say capital punishment is cruel and unusual punishment. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to agree with that. Um, I don't know that that was necessarily the intention of this, but at the very least, they're saying torture is not allowed, which um, we can agree with. Unfortunately, in certain military contexts, that hasn't always been upheld in our government, and mm -hmm. so that. You know, that's a huge issue. Yeah, and uh, it's so interesting because here it does not say, hang on, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, 
nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Punishments inflicted. We're we're deep into this like judicial part of the Bill of Rights. But if right. we isolate this amendment and just look at this, like okay, bail is part is is actually it's kind of related between the executive and judicial branch. No excessive fines imposed. That's more judicial, but no nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. By who? It doesn't say the state. Right. That's a good point. And so it's it's interesting, like, again, it's impassive how, voice. how are we applying this? Unlike some of the other amendments where it does explicitly say the state cannot take it away from you or the state cannot do this to you or the courts can't do this to you or right. this is right. by a jury. This is like this is just saying uh, cruel and unusual punishments shall not be inflicted. That's all it's saying. Okay, right. so does that apply to every person in the country then? Just nobody's allowed to in, in, inflict, or I guess maybe when they say punishments, maybe historical context is important there of like, well, punishment, maybe, I don't know, I have no idea. An authority. Was like specifically in the context, yes, of authority or the courts. Right, right. Um, so I think, I think that's interesting, but I think this also ties into the overall like philosophical aspect of the Bill of Rights, of like, right, right. yeah, this just this just ties into like, people have have uh, have rights, and you know this this kind of, I was about to say right to life, but again, it's shall not be deprived of life. It's not quite right. it's not quite a right to life, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of this isn't guaranteeing that people will have things, but just protecting them from being forcibly taken away. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ninth Amendment, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. I think that's just legalese. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. It's saying that there's no priority based on the number. Right. Uh, Tenth Amendment, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. And that's there because the people... Um, who insisted on having the Bill of Rights were very concerned about the central government having too, too much power. And so they wanted to make sure that it was clearly stated that the states um, had any power that wasn't specifically delegated to the government, rather than wondering if the government, the central government had any of those rights that weren't defined. Yeah, and I, I think this is also, um... You know, I mean, this is states' rights, right? When people say states' rights, they're referring to the Tenth Amendment, um, whether they realize it or not. But this is also why, when we see in other amendments that, like, oh, the final section is Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation or something along those lines. Um, no matter how short or long it is, it's always there because of this amendment that says the Constitution needs to give Congress the power. Um, and this is actually also really important, too, because what are the powers of Congress uh, or, or to, to the country if we go all the way up to the, uh, you know, the beginning of the Constitution? Um, it, it says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more, per a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish, establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Um, it, I guess, like, um, you know, uh, constitutional scholars have, have, have looked over, like, every law passed in the last 70 years or something has all almost always fallen under this general welfare clause mm. and so that's why some people argue that the federal government is overreaching because general this general welfare is being abused and interpreted too broadly mm. um, and i think that's just like an in, an interesting conversation worth having right uh, um to I clarify say, what that means mm -hmm. and so there, that's definitely like always something um to, to, to just like, I, I think I think that there is some merit to less federal government, but I, I think in at the same time it's like if you're gonna make that argument, then I, I think you also have to make the argument that like a lot of that that the federal government does do needs to be then replicated by the states, um, or or by your state, and and I sometimes I think people underestimate how much that really is. Um, 
you know, um, but but yeah, this is I, I think th this bring like this Tenth Amendment brings up a huge conversation around like the balance of the power between the federal government and the states, right? Particularly as we've seen the federal government gaining more and more power over the centuries, and like, is that a good thing? I think it's a question mark. I think that that's up right. to interpretation. I yeah, you know, my perspective is I think it has a little bit too much, but. Um, you know, there's also efficiencies that come with, um, you know, a central government. And so it's a balancing act. You, you don't want to go too far either direction, I think. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. I mean, I definitely agree there. And, and I mean, I definitely try to, when I'm forming my, like, policy proposals and stuff, um, like, thinking about, like, how can the federal government support states in ex right. and municipalities in, in executing these things without mandating them and overwriting their laws? Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's the key. Yeah, I think that that that, that is is how you better get that compromise. Right. Um, yeah. Sweet. Did you have any um, like closing thoughts or anything else you want to talk about or go over? I, you know, I can't think of anything specifically. I appreciate you having me on and, and yeah, so glad to have you. talking philosophy with me. You know? mm -hmm. And I think that this is a really important document to go through, like even if even for people who, who maybe don't um, agree with every word in here or whatever it may be, right. um, at least understanding what this country is, where it came from, where we're at, and what your rights are are right. um you know are, are really it's that's a really really important part of living in this country is knowing what this country is right um yeah sweet yeah well i really appreciate you coming on one more time it's been fantastic i'm sure uh we'll see each other again yeah for we... sure <laughs> all right uh well let me stop this stream thanks for watching everybody